expresión distinta. Es una locura. Ok, it's on now, so we're, we're capturing you. Okay. But I was talking to Rami before you guys came in about really, oh, we're trying to come up with a, a good project that will sort of carry us through, like, you know, all the different like, little pieces and try to tie it all together so we can, you know, find the clashes, uh, mark it up, uh, estimate it, and open a schedule or something like that. So I think what I'm going to do is really dig into the, 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 all the different projects. I think the hospital project that I have, the Riverside Hospital, is most interesting for having a lot of very detailed information. I'll go ahead and take a look at that, and we'll start to building examples based on that. But what I want to do today is just kind of keep on going with the whole notion of just really how we explore and kind of walk around in the models, um, just marking up things as we go. Think about how some of these cloud-based alternatives, things like BIM 360 and uh, both in the web-based version as well as in the mobile version work with that. And then they start getting into finding clashes, because it's really, I think, where you guys live and spend a lot of your time. So yeah, as we think about all that, probably the best place to start is just go ahead and if you can, and you have those models from last time, go ahead and open up or append if you can. What am I doing here? Looks like I still have that. Go over to home, I'll say append. I'm um, in Navisworks now. I'm just gonna go out to the conference center and like uh, pull in those files again, just because I think that's actually sort of an interesting one without being too awfully complex. So in those Navisworks files, I'm even going to go ahead and grab, let me say, all the NWCs. I'm just going to grab all three of them, MEP and structure together, okay, and just grab them at once. And there we have at least the initial starting point in terms of what this is looking like. Okay, so go ahead and open that up, and we'll take a look at a couple different things relative to it. As we were uh, just kind of starting to explore the model and work with the model, there's a couple things that I just want to kind of finish up with in terms of, oh, just thinking about how we work with the model. There is, as we think about like navigating within the model, there's a couple more modes I wanted to kind of point out to you that are sort of useful. We kind of talked about a little bit about panning and orbiting and zooming, some of those different things. There's actually fly, look at, and focus, which are some new ones I want to kind of throw to the mix here too that will just help us in terms of moving around and we'll do some things moving around, uh, you know, annotating things along the way to kind of capture them. So walk and fly are very, very similar. It really is just, they say it's like a flight simulator mode, but not only are you sort of pointing in a direction, but it sort of allows you to move up and down just by pointing in a direction. So let's just kind of play with that for just a second sort of build our skills with different things. The idea is, oh, in terms of working around in here, I have all these different modes like pan, zoom, and orbit that we're sort of used to. Walk or fly is the other side of walk. There's a little pull down menu here. If you choose fly, looks like a little paper airplane. As you go zooming on in, you can kind of think about yourself operating a paper airplane. Bunch of kind of dive and all the type of stuff. Let's distinguish that from walk. Walk being more, you're still moving the camera, but as I'm walking, I'm sort of walking on a plane. I'm just sort of staying on a plane, so I'm not flying up and down. So I can sort of combine walking with panning to move up and down to sort of get the same effect. The flying just allows you to kind of essentially point the nose of the plane towards some place you want to get and get there. So. That's kind of useful. We'll go diving on down. Okay, decide we want to be somewhere. Okay, the other kind of variation I want to look at is there's look around and there's look at and focus. Let's talk about that because these are all the things that really affect what it is you're doing you know, as the target, what you're actually sort of pointing towards. So. If you go back over and you say look around, that's the one where if you sort of picture that you're sort of just in this position and you just rotate your head to the left and you rotate your head to the right, look down, look up, you know, 
you pretty much, your head, your camera's in the same location, and you're just pivoting your head around, up, down, kind of moving all around. So that's actually pretty good in terms of looking at different things. So I can go ahead and look at some of those, that office furniture over on the fourth or fifth floor there. The other ones that you might want to play around with that are also in here are, there's look at. Let's kind of take a look at that. What look at does, Theoretically, it looks at a particular point in the scene. The camera comes in alignment with that point. So let's see how we can actually play with this. If you look at and you choose something like this sheet of glass, okay, it just reorients things and really says, hey, I'm going to focus on that thing. So again, if I say look at and I choose to look at that glass panel, if I choose to look at oh, something here, it rotated me up. I'm looking at it but just kind of from a different perspective. look at the top of that. It just always sort of brings that little thing particularly in focus because that's really the thing that you want to uh, pay the most attention to. I'm going to go back to the home view just to pop back out. Look at has another thing that's very closely related to it called focus. It's really, it's going to keep looking at something until the next mouse click. So the big difference here is it just seems to be temporary. So if I say that I want to focus on and I'm going to focus on that wall, okay, I'm focusing on that I can orbit around. What it's doing is it really makes that thing, the object, like the center of my world, that sort of becomes the thing I want to focus on. Or I can say focus, and I'm going to focus on something over here in the little visitor center. And I'll, again, orbit around. Try that again. Focus. Orbit. So it moves the pivot point. If you're zooming in or zooming out, that kind of becomes the center of your world. I don't know. Focus is another sort of interesting little tool to have. So we're going to play around with these. There's going to be different times, but they're all sort of useful in terms of getting in and out of different things. Because as you're navigating around here, you guys get to have control over just how you control your viewpoint in the camera. OK. Enough of just kind of the general stuff. Let's go on down to some of the specific things we want to do. The idea is last time we were talking about walking through the model, we started creating little animations where we could sort of set some different key points and combine some segments together. I want to walk through the model again a little bit more and kind of pick up with something actually Nicholas asked about in terms of the properties and how to really get information behind an item or even start changing the appearance of the location of things temporarily. So the idea is the scenario is still we're just navigating around and exploring the model you know, in a very ad hoc way. We're going to do it in a very systematic way in terms of looking for clashes or things that we think we're going to find. We're going to walk through it a little bit, but then just interrogate the little model a little bit. So to do that, how about going back over to that model and maybe you can fly up to the front door or something like that. What I kind of want is something that's actually an A360 where you click on an object and it just takes you right there in front of it. But this will get me pretty close. Okay, so I flew over there. Great, now I'll just start walking again. The idea is at this point, at any point really, if I want to go through and start interrogating things, I can. And that is not just kind of look at them, but really start asking questions about them. So. If, for example, you select something like that pair of doors, you'd really like to know about it. And Nicholas asked about it, and we sort of found it the other day in terms of the home uh, tab. You can find these different display options, including per, uh, the properties window over there. I think you can find it at a couple of other places, too. But the properties window is a very useful one, because for anything we click on, whether it's the column, you know, tell us whatever its properties are. It'll tell us not only sort of the name properties of it and stuff like that, but the really important thing for us is we start to get information about, oh, the element properties, because these are the ones when it comes time later to go ahead and do some searching and constructing different sets and looking for things, these are the values that we have available to us. So one of the hardest parts about, in general, working with Navis is you bring in models from all these different sources and you don't know what fields different objects make available. This actually makes it available to you, so you can start to see really what everything understands about itself. So this thing has a glazing material, it has thickness. 
that's just something metal aluminum. I guess that's just the panel itself. This is something else has thickness, this glass wall. It's some sort of assembly. It's a curtain wall assembly. But there's different information that's available about things. So the properties window turns out to be very handy. The properties window is kind of cool in that it sort of tells you what the objects are. It's not very good about telling you about the size of objects. And that's something you might want to know, too. So I just given you this NWD file, and you really don't have access to the underlying web document. This question of, you know, can you really start to figure out how big or how far apart different things like that? Really, what is the size of that door? And it turns out you can. There is a set of tools. It's under the Review tab that lets you play around with this. And it's these measure tools that are up here in the corner. Okay. Measure lets you temporarily measure some things. If you really like a measurement, you can save the viewpoint and kind of document it, keep it around. But what the measure tools do are, you can kind of take a look there, there's all sorts of stuff about point to point or point to multiple points or measuring an angle or accumulating dimensions. Let's just try point to point. That's kind of an easy one. Just try. Let's try going from the corner, like the upper left-hand corner to the upper right-hand corner of the door and just see if we can measure that thing. So you say point to point. Let's see what I can do here. From that point over there to this point over there is right around 1.75, 1.727 meters, something like that. Okay, so that's something to work with. Of course, this is not my favorite uh, system of measurements. Maybe we should try changing the preferences to sort of see uh, how that works. Oh, where is within here locations, environment? Let's try under there. No. Interface, let's try display units. How about that? I'll change that back to feet and inches just because that's the most familiar kind of measurement system to me. Actually, I should ask. Like uh, in South America, it's, uh, it's all is metric? Yeah. So for you guys, metric's very easy. Leave yeah. it as metric. <laughs> it's, like a, yeah. it's hard to work in measures and units that are outside the which are, you know, you, you know, you know what, what I've always wondered. It's like how do transnational companies do you know like Bento has the OGNC headquarters in Houston but uh, I think it's the infrastructure headquarters in London. So uh, like and, and they transfer engineers from both projects or, or even like if I don't know, Turner has worked in China, you yeah. know, it's China's lot of metric system, so how do they I think the default is actually the metric system. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah so yeah, we're kind of you know, be headed about the fact that we like to put everything back to sheet inches because it's really the less common system. Yeah, in Bethel, I had we had an issue when, when I was entering the last summer because the drawings were done by a German company. Yeah. And they first did it in metric system. Yeah. But uh, I think the contract specified that it had to be Exactly. The good news is, at least if the model's keep it internally, it shouldn't matter. You can flip back yeah, and forth. But every once in a while, you get these things where you're not really sure is that meters are feet. <laughs> and like, uh, that's where you get in big trouble. Yeah. There's a lot of famous examples of like where things get uh, really messed up because if that number is not something that you're familiar with, who knows whether it's 100 meters or 100 feet. You know, it, it should, uh, yeah, at least when things are obvious. Like in this case, I know that doors, in this case, it's, it's interesting, it's eight foot nine or something like that. Now, doing things point by point is kind of okay, just in Okay, wait. Notice the temporary dimension, though. It's kind of like hanging around just for a little while, but it's, you know, not going to stick around for too long. If you want, you can lock measurements so that they actually have, like, in the x axis or in the z axis, and that's actually very useful to you. So, for example, if you choose lock it in the direction of the z axis or lock it perpendicular to something, okay, then as I pull it down, you know, it's, it's less likely that I'm going to offshoot somehow. So uh, that's eight foot eight, basically, or something like that to that door. Same thing over here. Where a lot of people start to use this, even in these models, is when they're trying to figure out what the clearance is. So between the bottom of, I don't know, that little soffit in there, or some side feature to the top over here. Yeah. You're trying to, you don't have access to the actual drawing, but you're trying to figure out from this point here, 
to that point there. Okay, that's around three foot seven, something like that. So people play all these games in terms of really just trying to just add an Alice works drawing, get at the information they need. Because if I gave you an MWD file, so I didn't give you the original file from Reddit, I didn't give you some of the files you could change, that is giving you an MWD. It has all this information in there. I can still sort of get the information I need, even if it's not dimensioned. It's not a great way to get it, but it's something better than nothing. So in the same sense, if I did this and I locked it along sort of the x-axis, I could say, let me go from this corner of the wall to that corner of the wall. So it's around 19 foot 3, something like that. Now, these... These little dimensions that are hanging around over here are just temporary. If you actually want to hang on to them and keep them around for later, what you need to do is actually say convert to redline. And what that'll do is all of a sudden it'll say, great, I'm not just a temporary dimension, it's actually an annotation that we can keep around as a red line on this uh, viewpoint. So I can say convert to red line. Okay. Notice what happens. When I said convert to red line, it created a new viewpoint down here. Okay. And now this dimension is actually a piece of text. So if I move this around, that dimension is going to stay around. So even if I go through and I let me orbit this for doing something odd. Let me go back to the viewpoint. The viewpoint has it. The viewpoint stores that. Okay, so go ahead and orient it the way you want to. But this could be an okay way of just, you know, really quickly sort of passing information back and forth. The big thing is, notice that the viewpoint, the same viewpoint has that. But as soon as I navigate away, so again, I'll orbit and pop away anywhere else. Okay, I'm no longer in the viewpoint. Okay, I'm sort of have another view which is similar to the viewpoint. not actually in the viewpoint. So if I want to return to that viewpoint, I go clicking back over here and get to it. Okay. The other really cool thing that gets saved in viewpoints, though, is all this red lighting information, or even tagging. Well, I don't play with tags very much. Let's try to red line. In red lighting, the big thing is, you know, at any time in a viewpoint, you can go ahead and put some text in, draw, or even erase. And again, that's going to be saved as part of the viewpoint. So if I go through, let me just rename this. This is the entry, okay, glass feature wall detail. I can go ahead and draw something in here. I can draw clouds, ellipses, do a freehand drawing. I can choose the color I want to draw with, the line thickness I want to draw with. I want to really make it very accessible. Okay, and again, that is now stored as part of the viewpoint. That isn't actually stored in the model. Well, it's in the Navisworks file. I could even put some text in here. Hmm. This detail looks odd. So great, now I have a little piece of text in there. In a way, all these different little viewpoints, all these little save viewpoints, and whatever we put on there, even the little comments we put on, you know, become then, it's really information we can track back and forth. We can send messages with that viewpoint in it, and can send it to you for resolution in a way, at the beginning of our advice. And they, they update, they, the person that you sent them, how does it know that you're, that you an email? Or? Well, it kind of depends how we send it. It's interesting. Let me think about this. In terms of how, I got to think about it in terms of how you would want to sort of indicate what the status of it is. Hang on just a second here. I can export the viewpoints as a report. I can import them. Even in there. No, that's just the viewpoint and the location of it. 
I'm trying to think about the whole status thing. I know how it works within the, the part where you actually find conflicts, but this is kind of interesting. So I'm not sure what I would have to do that, whether I have to sort of put them in a folder and say for Andy, or what I would have to do, or you know, in terms of whether those are resolved or not. Because really, yeah, as far as I understand it now, it's just a viewpoint in there. Even in here, you see what comments can do for us. Ah, comments are a little bit different. Let's take a look at this. Okay. How do I do? I'm viewing the comments, finding the comments, quick find the comments. How do I add the comment? Add a comment. Actually, I should have, I did that very quickly. What did I, I right clicked on here? go ahead and give it sort of new that it is kind of waiting to be resolved on. The author's Glenn, the comment ID, the status is new. Okay, let's try and move it around a little bit. Okay, there's no comments on that. When I come back, I guess I can put as many comments against that viewpoint as possible. But kind of a good thing is this whole thing, you'd like to sort of retire the comments. What else could you possibly do in here? Let's try something else in here. That's just the text. If I edit the comment, what I really want to be able to do is to sign it to someone so I can say, this goes to Rami. Okay, so theoretically now, if I go through and find the comments, text, Rami, am I matching the case? It says no objects found, status. Interesting. I'm not sure I don't play around with this interface enough to know about how this finding of the comment works because you'd want to be able to go back and find them again a little bit later. Okay. But marking up is the start of being able to do some different things. Other things you can do as we're going through are temporarily change the appearance or temporarily change the location of different objects. So let's talk about this. What this is actually what you guys do, like uh, in terms of some of the drawings that you're looking at. The idea is that individually we can go through and go through select items either explicitly or by set and set their appearance, set their transparency, or we can use something called the appearance profile. So let's show you how this kind of works. I think this is actually sort of what's going on on your uh, job. Let me hide the comments right now. So anyway, we have our object right here. So let me go ahead and I'm gonna create just a couple of uh, searches so that we can go through and find some objects. For example, one thing I did playing around with this was I said, okay, let's take a look at, for example, these elements. So this element, for example, has a lot of properties to it. One of the properties it has to it is it has basically the material metal steel. Okay, so if I wanted to find all the things that were metal steel and put them in sort of a single uh, selection set, it could just easily be that all the things that belong to a specific trade or a specific contractor or a specific work package or something like that. So the idea is as follows. I can say, hey, let us go ahead and I'm gonna bring open my sets. I'm gonna say, let's find some things and I'm gonna find Basically, oh, how about everything for whom item property? The property we're going to look for is material. I'm going to say it contains, and then you can actually look at a whole list here of the options of the things that are actually available, or just type in something. But if you say find all, OK, 
Okay. I'll basically grab all the steel on the project. And that's useful for me because once I have that, I can then save it as a set. Okay, and so I'll rename this set just to be material equal to steel. Super. So now that I have that, whenever I go through and choose that set, I'll get all the steel items. Let's try something a little bit different. For example, oh, this thing over here as an item material glass, so if I want to try that and be a little bit different, I can say not to worry. I'll say let's go through and just change and find everything that's made of glass. Again, item material contains glass, find all them, super. And when you have that criteria, you can say, let's make the search set out of that, rename it. So I've got a couple of search sets that could be useful to me for selecting all the steel, for selecting all the glass, or selecting nothing at all. Okay, you could always come up here and say like select none. So here's the deal. As we're going through playing around, you can go through and find specific items and change your appearance. Like for whatever reason, if you want to change the appearance of that column or some piece of steel up here, and you want to give it a different appearance temporarily, what you can do is see if you can grab the item. Now, as you're grabbing items, sometimes it's hard to grab items because they're behind other items. So what you might have to do is temporarily so that you want to hide something. So when, when you hide it, yes. then you model something on top of it? Say again. When you hide, so if you hide it, it's like the element doesn't exist. It it still exists in the model. It's just for the purpose right yeah. now, temporarily. It's just what? Yeah. It's just for viewing. So you can't yes. edit anything on top of it. You can't put an element on top of it. It's you well, can't, it's, you if you're hiding a glass, you can't put a beam right there. It's um, just temporarily unavailable to you. So it's still there. Like. I was going to hide it just so I could select the beam behind it. The glass is still understood as being there, it's just hidden from you right now. Would it be able to still look through design? Yeah. Oh, and then you're hiding? Yeah. Oh, in that case, no, then you, you can still put the beam on top of it. Yeah, no, the hiding is really just, it, 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 yeah, it has no effect on whether you can uh, put an element there. It really is just around for the sake of viewing. Okay, so it's not smart in that sense. Okay, but that's okay. We're going to tie in a minute. We're going to show you how you get smart about the fact that there is a console there. So, in general, if you want to grab some specific element and say that super, I want to grab that thing. If you want to change its appearance temporarily, there's a couple ways you can do it. There's this override item where you can override its color, override its transparency, or override the transform. Let's talk about that. So, if for whatever reason, you want that beam to be highlighted in a different color right now. I want it to be vibrant green. I can say OK, and it's going to show up in vibrant green. You can also, if you want to override that item, say override its transparency, and you can make it a little uh, less opaque than it is right now, which could be useful. The whole idea of overriding the transparency thing it's actually kind of nice if, for example, you wanted the walls to be there, but you wanted to be transparent so you could actually see the plumbing in the walls. You know, you sort of get the ability to kind of ghost things out. So you can set these and save these sort of properties in terms of the appearance and the overriding and all that type of stuff. Or, and you do that individually, another way to do it, which is really nice, though, if you have a set that you use an awful lot, is something called the appearance profiler. What that does, it says, okay, I'm not just going to select them individually. I can select these and change its appearance. I can select those and change its appearance and do all that. But if you really have something that you're going to use consistently week after week for a report that you're going to keep on using or some presentation that you always give where 
what was it for you? Who's always in blue and who's always in red? There's like, there's some color distinction that helps you sort it out. What you can do under appearance uh, profiler is this. Appearance profiler basically lets you either by property or by set set up some different properties. So this is gonna be another case where the sets, the stack that you created sets becomes useful to you. Because you can say, great, by set, I'm gonna get all that steel, super, all that steel, let me test it. Okay, all those things. I'm gonna make those, oh, kind of fuchsia-y. Okay, and I'm gonna give them, oh, like a 70% transparency. Okay, so whenever I run this appearance, okay, that'll happen to all those. For the glass, super, let's take a look at that. We'll basically grab all those. For those, I'm gonna change them so they're kind of green. Okay, oh, and 50% transparency and add that. So all I'm really doing is constructing a profile of how I want them. And you can really create as many different profiles for different types of meetings and different types of presentations. So if you always wanna be featuring a certain sub's work but have everything else filtered out, you run it. So this is how it looks from that perspective. Not especially good looking in terms of what's going on. But if you want to now, you can save these away, okay? And this specific set of profiles, I'll call this my uh, contractor one. Super, I can save that, I can reload them, I can sort of basically create a whole bunch of different ones for different people. So let me try that real quickly. I'll say for the steel, instead, I'm gonna come back and make it a kind of teal. I'll run that. Oops. Oh, I have to add it. What I should have done was actually just updated it. Let me delete that criteria. Great. So let me save this, this contractor two appearance. So you can kind of keep on changing them around different ways as you want them. In the end, when you finally want to get rid of like all this stuff though, what you can actually do is Oh, probably the easiest way to do it is you can either select it and say reset the appearance and get them back to the way they were normally. Or you could just go back and in the tree, in the selection tree, you can grab them that way. And just say, let's just grab all three of those. Or even over here, you just say select all. And item tools, reset the appearance. Now, a variation on this theme that I'll show you that I only kind of uh, um, became aware of because I was at a Navis Works Season Green Meeting up in San Francisco where a bunch of people who were working on Levi Stadium were talking about how they use Navis Works in a way that kind of qualified people. And that what they were going through and doing is they'd go through Navis Works, they'd look for they had all the piping, plumbing, yeah. things they had to do, and the running from the stadium, and everything was kind of going good. Like, if they discovered a problem like this, so you sort of see this pipe or this piece of ductwork seems to be running right through, Lord knows what, I don't know what that is. Okay. They would use this feature. Okay, you can go ahead and let me just go ahead and, oh, let's even take that glass. For the purpose of what we're doing right now, so great, I'll do all those, and hang on, what I wanna do with that. I want to basically hide all the glass. I'm just doing that to get it out of the way. So I'm not messing around with it. Okay. Then they'd go back and grab something like this piece of pipe over here. You can do something that's called override the item, do a transform on the item. Actually, let me grab the pipe again. It's hiding right there. 
and show that, oh, well, you know, if only I move this pipe in the x direction by feet, oh, I'm going to move it three feet over in the x direction. Okay, everything's going to be fine now. So they would make changes like that to the model. And like, like solve the problems they need to solve without actually having to go back and kind of reintroduce an RFI. Okay, so watch what's happening here. Let me reset it. Yeah, I'll undo it. Any item in the model, okay, with, you can go through, let me just do it to this beam out here, or this column out here. You can take it and you wanna say that over item, you wanna transform it temporarily, okay, and give it a distance. And it'll move it out. Now, it's, it's not a very good thing to do you, for a specific presentation purpose, this might be useful where you can sort of pull things apart and make an exploded diagram so you get the sense that, you know, how all the pieces of the assembly fit together. But it's a little weird again now. This won't be saved. It's really just a temporary transform. So next time you open the model, it's going to be right back where it belongs. Or I can save a viewpoint that has it and keep it. For presentation purposes, can, can you do walkthroughs in render, renderings or is rendering a image? No, rendering is, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's just a feature. So yeah, it's just as you're suggesting, like uh, this view, as we're looking at it right now in sort of the viewpoint tools, is kind of set up, let's kind of take a look at it. We'll say viewpoint, okay. In terms of the mode, right now I have it a shaded mode, that makes it a little bit quicker in terms of what's going on. If you say full render, Let's turn around and see what happens. And I need to go over to my render tab and make some changes. So here's the deal. It doesn't look very different right now because, well, not a whole lot seems to have changed, but let's go ahead and start assigning some materials. If I go to the Autodesk rendering tab, okay, we could actually start putting some materials on the model. And what you want to do is, you can do it like item by item, or you can actually do that by creating some mappings in here. But let's see if we can sort of select some items. For example, oh, what can we do? Let's see if we can grab all that steel. So you working with some of these things together, let me get the sets window out, or just choose all the steel, okay? So now that I have that, I can go through and come up with some different appearance for it. So let's see what I have in the metallic paints. Right now it's kind of red. Oh, I got in paints. If I wanted to go through and paint it black, doesn't sound very interesting. Glossy black, glazed fire brick, slate gray. So if I go ahead and drag it over, Now it's all kind of slate gray. If I wanted to go through in some other sense, uh, what do I have over here? Let's do all the glass. I'll select all the glass. Again, this is where having all your sets makes is so useful to you. Oh, I have all the glass hidden right now, don't I? That's why, that's not a good selection right now. Let's do something else. on these doors or something like that. So great, I'm gonna go through and find some wood as opposed to being, oh, the kind of light color that they are now. I'm gonna go through and try and change their appearance around a little bit. But as you're doing this and you're just really colorizing all these different things or uh, you know, kind of applying different materials, It actually has a lot of different things going on there. Um, as you now go through and start walking around, can go on down, go ahead and I'll turn on my gravity now.
you know, it is the rendered materials appearance. So even things like, oh, if you want to change the appearance of all the door frames, or you want to appearance, change the appearance of a wall or something like that. Again, uh, what can we do here? Some sort of wall covering, floral brown. Doesn't that sound nice? So it's actually pretty easy to go through and do the rendering. And again, rendering has a couple of different settings. Rendering is, it's dynamically doing it, so just as you go walking through on the fly, it's kind of automatically making those changes. So live within your walkthrough, that's kind of okay in terms of what it's doing. If you want to go back and kind of up the ante in terms of making it a little bit better, we can get to different types of ray tracing up to higher and higher quality. Okay, and it really is for this viewpoint. So you can sort of make it better or worse depending upon what you actually need. For the view. Although I think the more, yeah. I'd be cautious about it, because the more you set it up, you know, the kind of harder it is, or the more time it's going to take to go and do it all. I'm going to turn on his collision. OK, he should be able to walk up the stairs then. Rami pointed out that evidently in this model, it's easy. You, you can walk to holes. <laughs> There's the brown covering again. But again, as you're even applying the materials, though, you're going to find it's going to be far better for you. See how much slower it is about responding. I think that's because, uh... Yeah, it's much slower than the other one. The other one's really bigger. Well, I think in this case what may be going on... Let me try turning the, uh, the rendering deck down again to low quality. I think it's somewhat better. But even in terms of its responsiveness, you know, in terms of the viewpoint, if you said that over here, it was back to more like a shaded mode. So think about, it's the difference between what you want in your live walkthrough. You can always, at any point, if you want to really have the high quality rendering, sort of click over here and say export the image, and it'll go through and do the rendering either internally out of this, or under the render tab, you can send it off to the cloud and use one of the other render images. Inges. So let's even kind of try that. Let me kind of pop back out to the home view as a starting point. Let's fly on down. I should save that viewpoint and get onto that office floor. Crashing on in. Okay, not too bad. So here we are. Let's try this in terms of uh, changing some different things around. Here you are looking at it shaded. Let's go back to the viewpoint. You could, uh, again, say make it a rendered mode. It's a little bit different in terms of what's going on. Actually, you can sort of see the brown color is still there. But if you wanted to go through and get a higher quality rendering, you could uh, send it off to the cloud. In terms of rendering the cloud, realize this will work very much like it does in um, the Revit, in that you can just sort of get the current view. You could also get like a panorama if you want to, to kind of swing around and kind of get all those things. So it's good to like. Uh, Yeah, be able to do some rendering in the background and be able to do it for a model that's not necessarily a Revit model. Okay, so that's enough to get you going there. Let's go ahead and let's play around. 
In terms of what would be most useful to you next, what would be next? I can sort of show you how you do all the same stuff you kind of, uh, on, a, you know, on an iPad or on the web, or we go off and start heading to clash detection. What's sort of most interesting to you in the next uh, 20 minutes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Will we write yeah, right back to you? Yeah. Oh, oh whatever you want. All right, you want to that? I mean, okay, let's go we're going to cover everything at the end, right? Yeah. Anyway, so, yeah. Okay, no worries. The idea is Navis works as a big old viewing environment is kind of really cool in terms of being able to kind of access it this way. The other ways you can sort of access it, like for anyone who's worked with BIM 360, you know that it's also available there. Okay, in terms of thinking about really the difference between, oh, BIM 360 and doing things in Navis works, the big important things to think about are this. The most important thing about BIM 360 is that it's just a cloud-based alternative. So as opposed to passing a lot of files around, you're passing basically just things up to the cloud and everyone's accessing it from the cloud. And because of that, you know, you're getting versioning on the files. So you, know, you always have the current version, the previous version, the version before that. You still set up your viewpoints and everything, but it really just happens through sort of cloud-based sort of posting as opposed to sort of passing files and creating these NWFs, these sets. In terms of how you can access it, there's a desktop application as well as a mobile application, and they're kind of lighter weight applications. I kind of like it from that standpoint in that, especially if I'm sharing with someone who doesn't have Navis works on their machine, I'm sharing with someone who just has an iPad or just has a web connection but doesn't have everything, they can start looking at the model, navigating around the model without needing kind of to install all that. But the same sort of uh, feature is happening. You integrate the models together, you walk through them, we'll look at the properties or measure them. We can do markups and create issues and do clash detection. All those things are true. So in looking at that, let me just kind of show you a couple different ways to look at it. In Navisworks, we can send things to glue very much the same way we sent them, like from Reddit. So if you had a bunch of Reddit files, you could have glued them directly. Or if you're in Navisworks and you've integrated all the models together here, you can glue that. Either way, just kind of, it's always sending them up to the cloud. And when it does, what it actually creates, if you want to go out there, remember I sent you that invitation to the BIM 360 yeah. kind of link. Okay, go on in. Let me see if I can sign on in. This conference center is actually out there. Okay, so if you sign on in, let's see if I have it there. Oh, if you go to it's b4.autonist.com desktop, which is an awful sounding, that'll get you in if you don't have it already installed here. Again, it's just sort of, it's b4.autodesk.com desktop. Is it called Autodesk 360? It's called BIM 360. A360 is kind of a file sharing service. BIM 360 is this kind of coordinated. Uh, so it's b 4 dot autodesk.com and then desktop right what was that just uh forward files Let's see if you can get that guy if you can hopefully we'll open up the application for you what do you do okay have it here on so b4.autodesk.com desktop Okay, and if you can get it to open, when you log in with your Autodesk ID, it should look something like this. Pull it over there. And then we have some projects from last quarter, but if you go scrolling down the list, you should find, oh, 220D or one, there it is. I put it under session one, but uh, you see the conference center is there. You can click on that and open it. And you should get something that looks an awful lot like the Navisworks window.
Okay, so really what you're looking at is a cloud-based rendering engine that really has an awful lot of the Navisworks capabilities in that. So that is the same kind of model that we sort of have been looking at over in the other application. In terms of working here, you still have the orbit, the walk. If you pull on down there, you have fly. You know, all the same sort of tools are available here. It's just happening in a web-based version as opposed to an application-based version. So see if you can go and fly yourself on in there. I seem to be over ground right now. So I'll start walking again. I can turn on my little third person, crouch, gravity, all that stuff is still back in here. So, so Rami, do you have it up on your machine? Excellent. Okay, was so this environment is really amazingly like kind of the other one in that you have, although the tools are sort of hidden behind these kind of little cryptic toolbar symbols, they're still the same tools. Let's kind of show you what you got available in here. Over here you have the which model to show. So right now the conference center has architecture, MEP, and structure. So you can turn on and off different layers, very much like we were used to doing over in Navisworks. I can turn off the structure, turn it back on, turn off the architecture. If I just want to see the structure or the MEP. So you get all the same sort of choices about kind of turning things on and off. Even that whole notion of the model tree is even here. If you go under architecture, you'll start to find it's all those same sort of things, although this might look a little more familiar in terms of there's different types of walls, the plaza surround, and again, you could turn on anything or turn off anything depending on really what you want. So it has all the viewing stuff we're sort of used to. Okay. Other things that have available include there's viewpoints or views. Views are kind of hanging around down in here. There's a special little window full of those. And if you get to a spot that you sort of like, so that tree is not exactly the same tree as we have in Navisworks, right? No, exactly. It's uh, really, it's, it's organized a little closer to the way it is in the... Why is that? Yeah. I don't know. It seems better. <laughs> it seems like more organized. I don't know. Maybe they don't have everything. No, I think it is better. I, I, I think it is in terms of the little model tree. That's definitely a good question in terms of like why or is, why or not. You'd like there to be some uniformity behind that thing. In here, though, it's interesting. I don't think in this version I can save sets in the same sense. I don't think I can. Like, so we have to find other ways of grouping things together. Views are very much the same. So great, you got views. You say that. I, I, don't, I don't see the point of sets if everything's already in the tree divided by type. No, but it's super difficult in the tree. Yeah, or really where the sets will be much more useful is it's if you start setting up sets that need different criteria. Like I want, I, yeah, like trades. I, I want, I want, yeah, either by like, it could be a trade, it could be, I want all the doors that are greater than 100 square feet. I want all the, you know, it's when you combine the criteria so somehow it's selecting, I want all the pieces of duct work that are bigger than 16 inches wide. You know, yeah, then it'll be more useful. Because that's something where you can't just easily select it. You actually have to do a little searching in the database to find what you want. Because that idea is even you know, if we start using it for management, I want us to basically see all the precast panels for the outside of the garage that are scheduled to be erected in the next two weeks. You know, and it's like, oh, OK, because I don't care about all of them. So that's going to be more useful. So the more data you put in, the more useful. OK. Over here in terms of views, if you want a view, you can add it. You know, this is my view. I'll save it. I'll give it a name. This is third floor flying. It 
sort of works very similar in terms of being able to get back to it. Redlining, again, works sort of like the same with markups. I choose a markup, I want to add a markup, and I have these different tools. And I want to, you know, take care of these things over there, and I'll save that away. Okay, and now there's a markup that, again, I can come back to later. So if I orbit away, and then I come back over here, I can get that. Or here it's a little more explicit. Is it when track, I want to. Does it track who makes it, who does it markup? And yeah. So it knows blend in this, and I'm going to send it to you, and then you can do some things, and like the history and so the it's colors. Like, it's like an RFI live. Exactly. In fact, over here even. Okay, so great. Can, can, um, we, can we both do the same model at the same time? Oh, exactly. Is this, is this, is this what it's happening right now? Exactly. So I'm going to send this markup to you. I'm going to send that one to you. Marks up, markups are only, you have to send the markup for other people to be able to see it? Can you just like um, save them and then next time somebody else comes in? What it does is when I send it to you, it will send you an email a message or a link that will take you to the markup. If, okay. you're just, if you just happen to be hanging around and you and see that the markup's there, you can go right to it. Oh, so it's like blue about it. So if you, if you save it right now, if you, if you create the markup right now, I'll be able to see it right now on my screen, if it we're in be, the same. If you go to markups, go to, yeah, just go to your markups tab and see this. Oh, yeah. I know there's a little uh, sticky. One minute ago, yeah. Okay. So why don't you go ahead and open it and you can edit it and see if you can add something to it. So I think for editing it, is the little hoo-ha there? It looks like the pencil. Yeah. If you click the pencil, you should be able to open it, and you should be able to make a change. And then sort of somewhere along the way, I'll see that Alejandro or Andy or Rami sort of made some adjustments to it. And we'll see. So in some ways, it's kind of nice in that just being built into this web-based system, you start having this funny coordination and live stuff. Yeah. Is that the same spot? So why, why is it it's, 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 it's probably has to sort of kick in. Okay. I think if you go out and then go back in. Okay. I know oh, you're right. It's it's got to be something that just sort of gooses it along. Let's come back into the markups here again. Ah, so Alejandro's made some changes to this. So now it's in there. So we start having a little combination of things like all working together. So. This, again, it starts becoming like issues that are attached to an RFI. Okay. Even in built in these systems is the ability, if you have an RFI tracking system, to sort of link these, really, these viewpoints and these markups, they're like live links that, they're nice in that, in addition to sort of writing the text, you can actually say, and here it is, it's this thing in the model, this is the thing I'm concerned about. You know, so being able to sort of pass through a model link is considered to be a good way of like uh, sending you the RFI because you can sort of see exactly what I'm looking at and then later on when Alejandro changes the model to fix that I can run this same viewpoint and see if the issue is still there or not. So that's the idea behind this. Okay. Down here there's some activities. This is sort of just a little running history of who's done some different things. What we're going to talk about next time together is clash detection. Clash detection being very much like within Navisworks, where we're going to go through and say, let's intersect some set, like all the steel and all the ductwork or all the steel yeah, and the glass. Yeah, that's the next thing. So, so you, you can decide what to, it doesn't do clash in the entire model, you can say just do clash on this section. Oh, much, much better, exactly. Because when I do the whole model, the problem is, you know, you get 10,000, you don't know where to start. Yeah. What you really want to say, my specific issue is I have all those intercom call boxes, and I have door frames, and I need to sort of see you know, what's happening in you know, a very specific thing. Because I, I really want to list the 10 things that are wrong that I can address, because 100 things are too many. And this might be kind of ignorant, What's that? but can you uh, do edits to a design in Namusworks or in BIM, or do you have to go back to Revit and then 
It's always you have to go back. So that is where you cannot make the column thicker. No. It's, and it's really, it's more of a liability thing. They think about it that someone owns that column. I can ask you, because you own the column, to make the change, but I don't want, yeah. So it's that funny one layer of responsibility, because, yes. It's, they do, however, have this tool. We'll show you when we do the clash detection. It's like, it's called switchback, where when I send you this, you know, you open it and you say, okay, show me where that is in the Reddit model. So I can, you know, kind of really quickly change it and go back. In, in, in the online version, it's called pinpointing, and now it's called switchback, but it's the same idea that when I send you a clash, I'm actually sending you the object so you can make the change and pop back and see if it fixed it. Okay. So the last little thing to play around with tonight that I want to share with you is just the same thing in the web. So it turns out that Navisworks files can be opened by BIM 360, the web application. Let's see if I can get to this. There we go. Let me switch this over. Won't play two. Or that one. Okay, it's coming up. Let's see what's going on over here. This is the chair that Rami and I were working on. It's taking a minute to paint it. I see carpet. Well, oh, there's the chair. I'm upside down. Okay, it's building it. No, that's what you did outside? That, wow. That, that's, that's what Rami and I were doing out in the uh, other room. It's still doing in terms of the pictures. It looks like it's having trouble with the mesh. Oh, my God. It's the work of 2000 Oh, okay, it's getting there. It's pretty... It's interesting. It's pretty good on the frame. Even that funny, the back of the frame. What's, what's the name of the software? It's called um, 123D Catch. But this is the whole thing. This is, you know, we did it with just uh, the iPad camera. It's, I usually say it's, it's accurate to within like, oh, an inch, half an inch, something like that. In this case, you see, it sort of, it, it messed up on the mesh. Because it really didn't get a very good sense of what's going on there. No, but this is insane. So this is the whole thing where like, if you want to do, I, I want to put a camera on a robot drone and basically recreate 3D models at yeah, the construction site doing that. That's actually, it's very, you sort of see for some things like, you know, the chairs, it wasn't so bad. It did a pretty good job. But yeah, I was just taking pictures. So the idea is with this, I could go ahead and take the photo or whatever. I can take the BIM model or the Navisworks model and overlap them, and you can start to say, are they the same or are they different? As a really quick way of doing a little uh, construction for, yeah, confirmation. OK. But what I want to show you in here is, let's see if I find it over here, BIM 360. Nope. That's just a bunch of presentations on it. There's BIM 360 glue. This actually goes to the web just the same as it opens. Anything else? Okay. So we have some models out here. This is, for example, the ones that we were just working on. Let's see if I can go to that one. Conference center right over there. Let's see if we can bring it on down. I also have it stored here locally. If you just sent me an MWD file in the mail, I can use it to open it that way too. Okay. So here it comes. 
again, just kind of hanging around on the iPad. In terms of working with the iPad, it's pretty much everything with your two little fingers. So with oh, the single finger, what I'm doing is orbiting around. With two fingers, I'm either pushing up or down to do a pan, or if I squeeze in and out, I'm zooming. Okay. If I want to sort of see different parts of the model, I can say, let's go to, it's this little guy down at the bottom that has like the, it's a square with like two little squares. Can you guys see it on the screen? It's this guy here. I can turn on and off the MEP or turn on and off the structure or the architecture, whatever I want. That's again, very similar to what is on the web interface. Even the viewpoints, I have these views. So I have three floor, third floor flying and looks like there it is, although it looks like, it's kind of interesting because I'm not seeing the glass that I have, the, oh. Looks like I have something turned off because it doesn't look like I'm really seeing it or am I just too far in? No, it should be the viewpoint. So I'm not sure why the glass is invisible there. Under markups, so check this out. Oh, looks like you just put something in there. <laughs> okay, very good. There's also like measurement, so that whole oh, measuring between two different distances. Yeah, tap a position and drag the second point. Let's see if I can do this again. So I can get you know, measurements. It's very, very similar to what you can do like in the uh, web-based interface. But where it really starts to be interesting though, and this is what I like it for very much, is this. Let's go down to the front lobby. Okay, this little tool, that this thing that's over on the left-hand side is actually like a walking tool. So if I hover on in, I can walk right in. Get them through a clashing. Spin around, I'll walk forward a little bit. Can you do the clash in the air? Track? You can't do the NS, nah. It's, yeah, it's, you're, you're viewing the model, but you're not clashing. But what I do like about it that I think is kind of cool is this, is this uh, little icon, it's this guy. So this is kind of walking up sideways. I'm just kind of dragging around with a video game. This guy, though, uses the little, it's actually the gyroscope in the iPad. So if I hold it up and I gyro it, see what I'm doing here. What am I looking at? Let me zoom out a little. Oh, there we go. Something. I'm, through, I'm in something. What am I looking at? Go back to the home view again. Try walking forward again. This gets you dizzy. Okay, so let's see if I can get this to work again. I gyro. I pivot up. Oh, there we go. So you can sort of play this little game to look up and over. So see, what's happening here is just on my screen, just like what you're looking at there. If I tilt up, if I tilt down, if I go around, so this starts to be that thing. You'd like to kind of like walk around on site and sort of say either, okay, here's the model, what am I looking at, and kind of do that. Or you can imagine just like what you talked about, Andy, with the whole augmented reality thing, you know, this thing has a camera on it. I could just be looking through the camera and see the model overlaid right on top of it. And you say, well, what is that thing over there? And the idea is I'd like to be able to say, okay, great. I'm looking at something. There's that doorway over there or something like that. Tell me about that. I want to say, what is that thing? Give me some information about it. Oh, it's the stair tower or whatever it is. Yeah get that stuff in there and say, okay, super, that's what that is. Okay, now I understand. Hide it, don't hide it. But yeah, that's the idea of kind of doing it on the iPad. So. It would be awesome for, for the punch lists that I'm doing or for like progress bills. Mm. If you go out and you have, you have to like account for what has been built and what hasn't. 
Exactly. Because you really want to go out like, there and you don't even know what you're seeing, what you're looking at. Because what I really want to see is it's almost it's the 4D view. If you had it all mapped to a schedule and you know for the progress building it should look like this as of this date, and then you go walking around and oh, this stuff is missing. You know, and you're like, okay, you have a really quick way of just filtering model information by time, or whatever. So that's where we're going. Okay? Okay, so let us adjourn then for today and let you guys go off and have a good uh, like weekend. I'll do some plan around about a model we can work with, but if you want to, you know, great. If you have, if you have access to do, do you guys have iPads? Do you have access to iPads? I have some extra ones. Really? Let me see if I can bring some iPads for us to play with, because it'd be good for not only this, but also for BIM 360 Field, which is the other one that go around, snap the pictures, and keep the punch list. If I, wait, this is actually really cool. What's that? If I get the MWD file, yes. and for like your job? For, for my job, yeah. and have your app in the software, can, can, yes. I, does it, can I walk around and lay over the design over the... Well, you, you'll be able to sort of see it. You can navigate through it. You can't sort of overlay it like in the camera view, but you can definitely yeah, navigate around in it. And if I get the NWD file, can I open it in Rarely 360? Yes. It's the same file format. Okay. So this is actually, this is the NWD file. Actually, I think this time I opened it off the web. But the NWD file. So if you get that, just bring it with you on a thumb drive or something like that. Okay. okay and then we can try to just like, you know, navigating around it and stuff like that. So you know, it's, it's, it's getting there. It's one of the things, you see the promise, and it's, it's like 75 or 80 percent there, and you can imagine the last 20 percent, you know by the time you graduate, it'll be, you know, it's going to be there. It's just not quite there yet. But still, you know, you can see the future coming. Okay, cool. Well, I will do it.